Hello and welcome to this very special Screen Talk. I'm Anna Smith, I'm a film critic and host of the Girls on Film podcast. And I'm a big fan of Miranda July, who I'm very pleased to welcome here today. Hi, Miranda. Hi, so glad to talk to you. Oh, well, congratulations on Kajillionaire. We will come to that later though, because we're here to sort of talk through your career um, now in making films. Of course, you started in as a performance artist, um, but the first time many of us saw you on screen was uh, Me and You and Everyone We Know, which you wrote, directed and starred in. One of the things I love in life personally is meeting characterful strangers, um, you, you know, kind of eccentric oddballs, and your films really give a sense of that and kind of replicate it for me. Um, talk to me a bit how you find your characters and where they first pop up in your head or whether you, you know, how you're inspired by real life. I mean, in terms of me and you and everyone we know, um, I, with that movie, I drew a bit more from the world around me than I often do, like more than I did with this last movie. And I know that um, Criterion just released uh, a new edition of the movie and that kind of forced me to go back and look at my journals and my archives. And I was sort of amazed to remember how many stories I'd pulled from friends um, and, uh, and just kind of morphed them in. And I think that sort of it maybe speaks a bit to a first movie, you know, where you are, like you can gather from your world and but you maybe can't do that again and again. Um, and I think as time has gone on, I've, I've figured out how to draw more from my unconscious so that um, which, which for me allows me to be more emotionally truthful. Like if I can get a a really good fiction going and just the right characters, like these sort of agile characters that I can follow anywhere, then my own truth comes out. Um, and if I get any more realistic or autobiographical than that, I, it tends to weigh me down, like I start to lose my powers. So, um, so I can take a, a little bit here and there from life, but um, but it's best if they rise up, you know, and kind of surprise me. I watched Me and You and Everyone We Know again this afternoon and I was sort of helpless with laughter in certain scenes. And when you watched that film first and you had um, feedback and you had feedback from critics, did people sort of laugh and cry in the bits you expected them to? Were the reactions as you would have imagined? Yeah, I remember sitting in the theater the first time I ever saw it in, in a theater at Sundance and I didn't I'd never sat among thousands of people and watched my work I didn't I was nervous but I didn't even know enough to be very very nervous you know um, and I remember yes hearing laughter at different points and things getting quiet and and thinking to myself oh I think if it were going well, this is probably how it would sound. And to be honest, when we had tested the movie and shown it at friends and family screenings and done feedback screenings, there was never any laughter. Um, and that just wasn't, it, it somehow wasn't something people did with something they didn't think was done, that they were sh unsure of, you know, up until the end, there's sort of like this big question mark hanging over, hanging over a movie, like, is this good? Is this, um, you know, what is the proper response to it? And I remember after the screening, someone who worked on the movie came up to me and said, did you have any idea it was that funny? And I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's how I wrote it. Like um, every single one of those things, like I were funny to me, you know. Um, but it was a relief, yeah, to finally have. Um, I, I guess just have it be complete enough that that alchemy with the audience could actually happen. In terms of the directing process on that film, um, can you describe how it was for you and working with the other actors? Because um, I know you'd made short films before, but on a feature film, how was that? I mean, so I had made six short films with myself in them, kids sometimes, non-actors always. Um, so I had this way, you know, this familiarity with the form, this, this basic confidence, but I hadn't worked with people who had been in other movies. <laughs> and that kind of made me nervous 
And so I remember in Me and You, um, whenever I directed John Hawks, you know, who to, to me was kind of a star, I mean, sort of total unknown at that point, but like I had seen John Hawks, you know, in his TV show. And, um, and so I was, I just was worried that he would be able to see in me that I like something that he had learned from other directors and that something that I wasn't doing. Um, and so I would direct him. I mean, I did my job, but every time I got to the kids, I was like, oh, okay, here we go. Let's, <laughs> now I have my powers back. Um, I'm not self-conscious. You know, kids, there's only so many other things they can have been in. I mean, especially like um, Robbie was, was six, you know, he, um, or five when we started. So, um, yeah, so I think that really worked with the movie. Like my strengths were able to support the parts of that movie that in a way would have been the hardest, you know? I mean, it's not easy directing kids, but for me, I, um, it was always a relief to get to uh, be, be confident again. How do you direct kids in some of some quite interesting edgy scenes in terms of the content? There's there's very, very funny scenes, perhaps the ones that maybe laugh the hardest, but how do you get that balance right? Well, I think part of it is is if the writing is true, you know, if if you're not setting them up in a way that's unfair through what you're writing, then you can have have faith in it, you know. Um, and I I mean I worked really hard at that dialogue to, to really feel like this is a, a child's view of sexuality, for example, in, in one scene, you know, I'm not adding an adult slant to this, um, you know, and I would whisper it again and again, kind of doing both sides as I do when I write. And so then, you know, I get to the actual kids and, and with them, I mean, the other thing with kids is you can kind of do line readings <laughs> in a way that, um, you know, for example, not one person on Kajillion Air would, would enjoy me reading the line for, for them. <laughs> um, but, you know, kids, it's like, they're not even going to mimic you so much as just get a basic understanding of like what the line even is. Um, and so it's, it's helpful, you know, you're kind of just showing them. And, uh, yeah, and I mean, I would do all kinds of things like I would to get, to, you know, to get Robbie, um, the character of Robbie play, played by Brandon, to get him to just look a certain way when he was really tired, like you need to keep looking up there or whatever. I would just like put something up there or have someone stand up there or, or you know, just do kind of um, whatever it took, you know. <laughs> Talk to me a bit, little bit about the role of coincidence in your films in particular with this one because it does seem to be a bit of a feature and that works very well well i mean coincidence for me is always like i just always take it as a sort of reassuring nod that i'm on the right track it's not like more significant than that i don't think like god is smiling at me or anything but um but i just think oh right there's uh, like an invisible underpinning to the universe and sometimes you get a little peek at that by how things align you know and there's you know hard, it's hard to n understand more beyond that but it, it kind of reminds you to keep having faith in your intuition and um, and you know believe in invisible things and um, yeah and that that movie is full of that. I mean, I, I think in some ways the, when I realize people think of it as a sort of light movie, even though it has all this dark stuff in it and this kind of quote unquote provocative sexual content or whatever, um, I think it's not just that it's funny or the color palette is light, but in a way, um, and I only say this having been forced to just watch it finally again after, you know, 15 years, um, I, I realized like, oh, that, that thing you mentioned, like coincidence and a, a sort of um, a sense of meaning in the universe that uh, 
has to do with with this like invisible alignment like that is is holding the movie up it's it's um it's not just holding the structure up um, that I wrote and created, but also kind of these lives as they're lived. Uh, and that, that is a, it's like a deeper kind of lightness, you know, it's like, a, um, it's not like whipped cream, it's like actual, um, like light from the sun or, you know, daylight. Yeah. What kind of challenges did you face in this film that you then took the learning from to your next film, The Future? It's one of those things like, until you go to the moon, you really are just practicing going to the moon. You know, there's no like half, halfway, <laughs> like going in a plane is really not going halfway to the moon. You know, like, I'm gonna take this metaphor as far as I can go. I like um, uh, and so, but once you've been, um, like you stop being like, other people in in a way like you've you've stepped out of civilian life and you always know that's there for you the moon and uh and you always want to go back um and you can now you know because you've done it once and so i think that's that was like uh, on a subtle level that was the thing that changed um like breaking through a membrane or something and then just on a practical level I mean, I had been making movies my own way, my own idea of what a call sheet might look like, my own idea of, um, you know, how a crew should work together. I mean, I had all those things, but I had no point of reference. I didn't go to film school. I hadn't worked on other people's movies. And so, um, you know, filmmaking, especially like in LA, within, you know, the, union system like it is very it is done the same way every time um <laughs> the call sheets always look the same way the hierarchy is always the same way and i you know i have various problems with that but um it, once you know it uh in a way you can spend a lot less energy learning it i mean i spent the entire time with me and your and everyone we know just like getting used to their way of doing things and figuring out how to still be creative within that. Um, and there's subtle things, you know, it's like about like that you have to break for lunch, you know, by a certain time, you know, or you get in trouble or, you know, all these little things that add up to potentially making you feel um, like cut off from your creative root, you know? And so I think um, I began at some point in that movie to, to realize like, oh, this is like anything else I've made, you know, I got to focus in just on what really matters here. And everything, everyone else can kind of sort themselves out according to this, this system if they want. Yeah. Right. So clearly uh, the rules didn't stifle your creativity with the future because it's a wonderfully original piece of work. Um, I remember it kind of splitting opinion in critic, critical circles. Um, I definitely loved it. Um, tell us a little bit about the inspiration because the cat, Paw Paw, and your voice for Paw Paw really is something else. Yeah, I mean, the inspiration for the future came when I was editing me and you and everyone we know, and um, I was broken up with very abruptly. My boyfriend at the time was like, you know, kind of flipped out. I mean, he later, reversed it and tried to get back together. And by that point, I was like, no, that was awful. Um, never again. Uh, but I remember that the feeling, and here I am like trying to finish this movie, feeling like, um, like someone had died, you know, like this, this, and, and, and this absolute shock. And, and like, I wanted to stop time, you know, like I just didn't, I, it, I didn't want this to have really happened. Um, and I thought, ooh, that's, that's, you know, it's the parts of it that are familiar, like I appreciate everyone's, you know, almost everyone has been through this, but there's something kind of esoteric about this, you know, it's, it's like almost science fiction, the level of pain. And um, I, I first got into that through making a performance about it um, called Things We Don't Understand and Definitely Are Not Going to Talk About. Um, and that was where I developed 
the talking cat and stopping time and all these um, kind of surreal ways to get at that feeling. And I think that was a great way to feel free again after making my first feature, like go back to a realm where literally nobody cares, you know, like <laughs> no one's going to make any money. No one's, most people are not even going to know the performance happened. Um, but free enough to like come up with a whole story and, and not feel self-conscious. And then I thought, well, where these surreal elements would be really interesting is in a conventional feature film. You know, it's one thing to do them in like an art house, you know, um, theater, but like a performance venue. But, but to do them in, in this world, in a world with houses and people and, you know, something that feels very real, that might, that would be a great challenge. Um, and yeah, and so I, I did that. And I mean, some of the, you know, like the fact that I voiced Papa, I didn't plan on that. You know, I really wanted someone else to do it. Um, and then as so often happens, like I was the temp voice and I became very used to that. And um, I brought in so many people, voice actors to, to do it. And in the end, I just worked very closely um, with my sound designer, Ken Sparling, and we made, we kind of figured out how to affect the voice to create a kind of cat version of my voice. Well, it really works. Um, you, you mentioned the challenges. I mean, what do you feel um, was the biggest challenge during the filming process of this one for you? In some ways with me and you, I was coming off of 10 years of my own context for myself, which, which included a lot of other women filmmakers because I had run this underground distribution project for women filmmakers called Big Miss, well, eventually it was called Joni for Jackie. Um, and uh, so Joni for Jackie created a world for me in which I was not um, a minority. I, I was one of many, many women directors that I knew. And then um, when I got to Sundance with me and you and everyone we know, I was sort of shocked to realize I was one of two women who had movies in competition out of 16 films. Um, and that was, that was, I mean, they've obviously worked really hard since then to have gender parity. Um, but I, it was kind of, it was kind of a shock and it, and it, I was made so aware of my otherness in promoting that movie. And, and then now I lived in LA and I was married to a director who was a man and I now had friends who were directors and they were all men because, you know, this was a while ago that, that too has changed. But when I made the future, I was right at the point where I was most, I most felt like an outsider, really. Like I, I had lost all the, like I wasn't doing Joni for Jackie anymore. I didn't, didn't live in Portland, wasn't in my own little world, but I hadn't yet kind of expanded to the extent that I could really own what I was doing in this new way. Um, and it, it's, it's weird. I mean, I can only see this in retrospect. And you also like, you work with that. I mean, it was a, it was also about a woman who was, and a couple who were stuck and, and had a lot of fear. And, um, and so in a way that wasn't wrong. Like I was able to show in some ways the discomfort of where I was at, at 35, you know, at that point in my life. Uh, but it, it was palpable. Like I didn't, I didn't feel free and how I felt most free was on the things like this, the special effects. Like I loved, I loved doing stopping time, figuring out how to have people freeze. And um, I loved making that t-shirt move. In fact, I loved being hidden in the t-shirt and, and doing that dance and working with a choreographer. Um, and it was interesting to see like the parts that I'm less comfortable with are the things that look like they're supposed to be me or look kind of autobiographical, but aren't really. Um, and um, 
I headed out of that. I mean, after the future, I kind of like was sort of like never again. I'm not going to um, like I, I have a like a tender place in my heart for that movie. But I also kind of learned what I don't what I didn't need to keep doing. How, when you look back on the film, have you watched it recently? No, I, I never I never watch my movies again after the premieres. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why is that? But I remember it. Yeah. Well, of course you do. <laughs> So if, if people come up and quote it to you, do you always recognize the quotes? Because I know some people actually don't when they, they don't watch their work as much as fans. No, I do. And I actually, um, you know, <laughs> I know now when I go up to someone that I admire, not to say that I love the work that's their hit, because... Right. It's almost like it's almost like you're insulting everything else they've done when you say that. So when someone comes up to me and mentions the future, like I'm always deeply gratified. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. Well, I'm a big fan of your novel, The First Bad Man. Just off okay, that's, that's so. acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, that's a hit, but um, I just wanted to say that I'm fan of all your work, but I thought that was such a tremendous tremendous piece of work and it also really ties into your filmmaking um, but let's go back to female directors because I'm interested to talk a little bit about that because it segues into our next topic um, but you mentioned that obviously things have changed um, and that's what on our podcast Girls on Film we try to celebrate and look to the future um, how much do you think the climate has changed say in the past five years and since Time's Up and Me Too for women in the industry? It really does matter um, these things that I, I don't know, I feel like some people think that was just a hashtag or, you know, um, a sort of superficial trend. But first of all, that's how things begin, you know, when, when people realize that um, they can't get away with saying something that they may feel in their heart. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, I think for me, it went from being almost like a, like a dirty secret that I was a woman or something. <laughs> like, I can't quite explain the feeling. I mean, you, you know what I mean? It, it, like this unspoken thing that we were overlooking, um, that, that there was this kind of disability that was also kind of a vul like a sexual vulnerability as well. Um, that kind of got like, flushed out and you know since of course I don't really I feel great like I feel very strong and, and confident so often that came out almost like um like fighting words or something you know like uh to to speak my actually as as um forcefully as I felt in the face of that a cloud that like um, icky, shameful, sexist vulnerability cloud that was theirs. Um, it it became like this. It was. It's, I'm trying to put my finger on something that is so insidious, but it was the feeling of my entire life up until Me Too. <laughs> and I remember actually, I was giving a talk somewhere, and it was the I, the first talk I'd given since Me Too. And I'm so used to standing in front of an audience, doing my thing, and a and occasionally saying something that I know tips right past the comfort level of men in the audience or, or even certain women and being, you know, like having this kind of strong feeling in my chest, like a, it's a little scary, but also like, I will do this till the day I die. Um, it's so important. And I, um, I remember saying something, I don't, I, I don't remember quite what it was, but it was one of those things that would have been a moment like that. And all the, like, I think one person made like a little sound, like a supportive sound. And then like several women in, in the audience like cheered or something. And I was like, oh, they're not afraid to show how much that meant to them. Like they would have been silent before, silently receiving my message. And now they're like, um, it, they feel safer. And therefore I'm totally safe up here. I'm like lifted up. And uh, 
and I was like, Ooh, that's, that's different. Like, um, that's not a, it's subtle, but it's total, you know, it's like the color of the air changing just slightly. Um, and yeah, I'm getting like <laughs> emotional because it's, it's, uh, it's not to be taken for granted. And when we're thinking about other kinds of social justice and change, you know, to, to realize like it, it is real, like just cause it's on social media, you know, in the form that you experience it most often or something doesn't mean it's not real. It's also happening for people standing in front of an audience and in every context. Um, uh, and I certainly felt that as I continue to make my work um, that, um, that, that I was experiencing that and all the women around me were. And so there was this collective safety and therefore freedom. That's powerful stuff. Thank you. The sisterhood is building. And I certainly feel that the term feminism is much more acceptable in sort of mainstream culture yeah. now. And it's, it's young women are proud to call themselves feminists, which is fantastic. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I remember in so many interviews for so many years, um, people would say, you know, feeling like they were being kind of naughty or daring. They'd say, now, would you call yourself a feminist? You know, like, and I'd be like, uh-huh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And now I really don't get asked that anymore, you know. Oh, that's good. That's we'll interesting. That. Yeah. We've well, I hope your work speaks for itself. I mean, also, yeah. But it's true. It used to be like a, you know, something offbeat and edgy, but now yeah. I hope yeah. it's soon the norm. Radical. <laughs> yeah. Talking of uh, female directors, let's turn to Josephine Decker, who directed Madeleine's Madeleine in 2018. And of course, you starred in that, um, another wonderful film. Um, I would say there's perhaps some common ground between her work and yours. They, you're both very distinct. What made you want to make this film with her? Um, I mean, I'm not generally like an actor for hire when I get offered, you know, when people reach out to me, I'm always like, are you kidding me? I don't even have enough time to do my own things, much less act in your thing. <laughs> um, but I had seen her work, um, her two previous movies, and I was so curious about how she made those. Like, I didn't understand it at all. Like, I couldn't even begin to imagine her process. And so when she asked me, my first thought was like, oh, I could actually see how they're made. I could, I could be like a spy, like a director spy on her set. Because um, it's very siloed, you know, there's not, you don't really get to see how anyone else is doing this. And, um, and so that was initially why I said yes. Uh, it ended up being like, just incredibly cathartic, actually, to just be an actor. And it, it really sort of taught me about what what my actors were experiencing um it actually made me realize it's very joyful like i hadn't really gotten the joyful part because when you're acting and directing it's just frankly kind of stressful um but if you're just acting gosh i mean what's not to love like you're you're being taken care of like a like a child sort of all your needs are met and you're just your whole job is to just like feel your feelings and be present and um, try things. And so now I kind of understand when I'm working with actors, like they, they really want to be there and they're having a good time and they'd love to know, you know, like it, it's, it's simpler, I think to me now that, uh, you know, now that I've acted only acted in a movie, I, it's like, I understand the basic unit of measurement in, in filmmaking now, which is the actor, yeah. So the spy mission was successful? Yeah, totally, yeah. And, and, and now we're also really good friends. Um, and uh, yeah, and having like good friends who, who are also directors means that, I mean, so for years and years it used to be, I would talk with my friends about sex and relationships and, you know, family, everything in my work, everything but my work, you know, because that was just, who was going to relate to um, that? Like it just, it just would stop there. And now with friends like Josephine Decker or Lena Dunham, we talk about everything. And then we talk about casting and financing and, 
writing and you know i mean that's it i can't underline enough how good that feels yeah well that's great sounds like a good life um, <laughs> Let's, let's come to your new film, Cajillionaire, which I loved. Um, now, a, a wonderful story of an eccentric family of grifters. Um, but I read that it was inspired by a dream. Is that correct? Um, well, I want to be precise. I wasn't asleep. I had just woken up and I was lying there in that, that kind of half awake state. And I saw these three people walking towards me and in my mind two of them with this long straight hair and a man and i remember thinking okay i can fall back asleep and have this as a dream or i can reach across my husband and try to not wake him up and grab my phone and um and start whispering dictating what i was seeing and I did that on and off for the next few days as this story kind of unspooled. Um, so, I mean, lest that sound too easy because it really was a, a like a gift from the gods, I should say like, I think it was my whole life leading up to that, including like a year of really trying and trying to write something in this territory. Um, and then it came all at once um so uh, yeah i kind of set it up to happen when you describe the film to people how would you summarize it yourself i mean it never works <laughs> <laughs> um i you know i say it's about this family of very low stakes criminals who meet a stranger and pull her into their heist and it kind of turns their world upside down that's me trying not to give anything away, including that the movie is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. Um, and I love that, that you're working with, well, you're working with four great lead actors, but three of them are, are women. Yeah, talk to me a little bit about the casting process. Yeah, so this was the first time I got to cast lead actor women. I'd never gotten to do that before, and I'd always, you know, wanted to. And, and I got to, and there were three of them. And... Let's see. I mean, I, I know I had Gina Rodriguez in my mind still while I was writing. She, she was kind of the only person I saw being Melanie, which speaks to her and Jane the Virgin and what I had seen her do. It also speaks to how few well-known Latina actresses there were in that age range. Like I knew I was trying to cast familiar faces and, um, so just a, a nod to that reality. Um, but I was so, so excited when she read the script and I remember she, she wrote me, uh, this script is baller. Um, you know that phrase baller? Yeah, so um, it was just, it was just a, a high compliment. Um, and, uh, but that was actually sometime after I met with Evan Rachel Wood who, um, Unlike Gina, I didn't, I didn't know if there was an old Dolio in there. Um, I, she's such a shapeshifter. She's been so many different ways. And I, I remember meeting her for the first time, having dinner with her and kind of thinking like, give me a signal here if, if there's something in your soul that, that connects to this character. And, um, and at a certain point she said, you know, old Dolio reminds me of, this character I always wish I could have played, my favorite character in film history, Edward Scissorhands. And after getting over my sort of surprise, I don't know what, what I was picturing, but I wasn't picturing that it would be that. Um, I was like, oh, that's exactly right. That was, that was the signal that if, if you relate to Edward Scissorhands, then I think this is gonna work out. Um, and then Deborah, uh, I don't, know that I would have had the confidence to reach out to her, I, except she followed me on Instagram. And, and I began to realize like she knew my work. She actually was like a reader of my books and that seemed like a good sign. And, and so I reached out and, um, and she's very, very game and very brave. I mean, this is a woman who's like 
quite hot and has always played, you know, pretty sexy characters. And there's no reason she can't do that till her dying day. But in this movie, you know, no makeup, long hair, a limp. And she really kind of doubled down on that um, in a way that I think it was like not comfortable or familiar to her, but she used that discomfort um, to kind of get further into the, the darkness of that character. And how much of the physical comedy, because there is quite a lot that you're describing there, not just of the, their gait, but of them trying to avoid detection. And um, how much of that were you working with them on set and how much of it is on the script and pre-planned? I mean, the, you know, the limp is in the script. My sense of old Dolio was there, but it was working with Evan. Um, you know, just watching her, she'd be in my studio and I'd be like, okay, walk around. Um, okay, well, don't move your hands so much. What happens if you just don't move your hands at all? Does that look too weird? You know, just trying things like that. And then also trying to figure out how to sort of shut down all her, her intellectual space. Like, Oldolio is a full soul, but she's, she's got like a clogged output valve kind of and so initially I, I, I would ask her questions and tell her like she couldn't use language. She just had to make noises or couldn't even use noises. She just could use her body like an animal. And, and that helped, I think, helped us both find this kind of narrow shutdown space to work from physically. Talk to me a little bit about the themes in this. I think the, the aspect of parenthood is very interesting and in how people kind of um, create their own logic within a family, which might seem strange to an outsider, but seems perfectly rational within the family unit. Is that something that you were keen to explore? I guess I always sort of think that every family is, is kind of cult-like. I mean, not as extreme as this family, but every family has its own way of doing things. And often the, the children in the family don't know that it's just their family that does it that way until they until they leave and suddenly they're like what what no not everyone does that um and that that really common moment of transformation is sort of um it's like the basic unit of uh of when you see the world anew and you hopefully do that again and again throughout your life but that's i think often the first time and I'm, yeah, I was so interested in that and, and, and that sort of inherent betrayal in that, you know, like you're no, you're, you're, you're obviously going to stop being a good cult member now that you know. Um, and, and there's something sort of heartbreaking about that. And I, that heartbreak was really important to me to get into the movie. It's, it's a very moving film as well as being very funny. Um, and also there's something quite a lot about not really knowing your parents or thinking you know your parents and then being shocked perhaps by them. Was that, was that another thing that you were sort of keen to explore? Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember one of the very first scenes that came to me was this one at, at the baggage claim where as part of a scam, Oldolio's parents have to act like they don't know her, like they're strangers. And when she finally gets to that moment because of some things that have just occurred, they aren't just acting like strangers, they seem truly strange to her, mm -hmm. um, unfamiliar. And it's like she's seeing that for the first time. And um, it's, it's so, it's, so incredibly painful, yeah. Mm. I totally forgot the question right at the end there. No, no, um, you, 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 I just asked if it's something you're keen to explore, but, you know, your parents, not really knowing who your parents are. Yeah, what. right, right. There are a couple, let's not give spoilers, there are a couple of moments in the film where okay. she obviously has her eyes opened and it is yeah. difficult, difficult. But also I'm interested in the idea of people creating a new family as they get older and kind of finding new substitute parents in a way. Um, do you feel that's kind of what old Earlier is doing in a way is she's sort of floating the nest? Right, yeah, I, I have sort of this idea of like non-linear non time or like queer time in, in which maybe it doesn't matter 
when you do these things, like in the movie, they're like the breast crawl or, you know, all your birthdays, maybe you do them all at once um, and instead of year by year, like that, that you could be reparented um, and that, that could work. And that in, in fact, we all are, you know, we, we find friends and lovers who like kind of redo things that weren't done or weren't done properly the first time. So yeah, that is, that is what makes uh, old Dolio's transformation possible. Let's just talk a little bit more about the actors because also, you know, they, they blend so well together and, and there's a kind of awkwardness as well. How did you kind of get them to interact on set and in rehearsals in preparation to kind of get into those roles? Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes you would really want in rehearsal to make a family bond, you know, and do things together. We did some rehearsal. We, um, <laughs> we practiced this whole serpentine running thing, which we didn't end up using in the movie, or I, I cut that scene. But in a way, I think, like, I, I was trying to come up with things that w were crimes or, you know, the kinds of things they actually would do together. It's not so much about, like, sitting down and eating a meal together. Um, and I think in the end, I realized, oh, these people are, the, the couple needs to bond. Like they've, like Deborah and Richard needed to become a couple. And they're such pros, like they know their way into intimacy um, very quickly. Like I watched that happen over the course of an afternoon, basically. Um, but no one needs to bond with old Dolio. Like we can just absolutely leave that awkwardness as it is. Um, and she kind of kept her distance, I noticed, and um, sort of for the whole movie kind of stayed in her, her own world. Um, and yeah, so there wasn't, uh, I, I would say I'm, you know, I worked with her alone. I worked with Deborah alone, but I didn't, there was sort of no need. I didn't even have Gina Rodriguez until a week into shooting because she was on another movie. So, which worked fine for how she, how she enters the movie, like just completely out of nowhere. Yeah. I love the scene on the plane um, where they all meet first. Um, was that an enjoyable one to film? Because there's so much great comic energy in the air in that. Yeah. Oh my God. I mean, that was when I first saw how Gina and Richard interacted. And um, I mean, I could watch them all day together. Like those two just had a, a really dry back and forth. I mean, everything is, is as it was in the script there. And I'm, and I'm kind of a stickler for that. Like I don't really um, improvise, but the only little bit of improvising in the movie, I think is there are a few things in that scene, just because I was like, I don't know, this is hilarious. I, I think I can't cut this out, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, so there was, yeah, some tiny things I just uh, loved. Oh, I'm gonna have to watch it again and try and work out what those bits are, but it's really, it's a really <laughs> funny scene. And we talked about challenges earlier. Were there any particular challenges, maybe, you know, physical in making this film? Because there's some quite, like the bubble, scenes are quite must have been quite difficult to orchestrate no you know crazily enough when you actually are really supported at the budget level that is what the movie requires you have people who can make a bubble wall and and who test it rigorously and listen to your notes about viscosity and color and um bubble size i mean i was like in a dream i was just so happy uh to get to work with like such excellent effects houses and um, costumers. And I mean, the whole team was uh, made it a joy. Uh, it's funny that the one challenge on this movie was came after, after all of that, um, I couldn't figure out the music. And I, that had never been an issue before. I had always, you know, just hired my composer early on. Um, but I had had a little trouble with scheduling of getting the composer I initially thought I'd work with. And then I kept trying different approaches. And I got to the point where I had locked the movie and still had no idea 
um, and already pretty much blown our music budget. And so I was kind of freaking out, but I still had a really clear image of it in my mind. And right around that time, um, right then, uh, this movie called The Last Black Man of, Sa of San Francisco came out at Sundance. And it was the first movie that this composer, Emil Moseri, had scored. And so no one had ever heard of him before that. And uh, we tried him out because we could afford him and <laughs> he was available and, um, and talented. And, um, and I remember the first day that he played, he was like, well, I've, I, I, you know, watched the movie because it was done now. Um, and I just tried a few things on the piano and I'll play them for you on my, on my phone. And I remember thinking like, oh, this poor guy doesn't know that I'm like the princess in the pea with this movie. Like, it's not that easy. And the first thing he played for me was, it was like what we ended up calling the love theme. It's, it's like the music that plays when um, Melanie's taking off, or Old Dolia's taking off Melanie's nails. Um, and it was just the most perfect thing I'd ever heard. And, uh, and we worked together for the next five weeks, which is all I had left at that point, budget wise. And, um, and it was, it was a great collaboration. So I don't know, it was, it was, I came to think that maybe on some level, I was like stalling the whole time until this, this guy like came into the universe, you know, made a movie, scored it. Um, Cause that ended up, you know, being absolutely right. Well, you mentioned collaborations and collaborations are also obviously so important in your work. Do you find yourself working with a lot of the same people time and again for that reason that when you just click with somebody? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, my costume designer, Jennifer Johnson, I had worked with twice before and, um, and she's just a friend. I mean, she's someone who like, we go vintage shopping together also. And, um, and, and yeah, you know, also happens to be like one of the very best costume designers there is here right now. Um, and Sebastian Wintero, <clears throat> I had worked with on a, on a short film called Somebody. And I remember saying to him when I was done with that, I was like, let's do a feature together. You're not gonna hear from me for a while. I need to write it, but I will email you as soon as I'm done with the script. And I did, and we, we prepped together for a whole year over Skype, because he's in Denmark, um, before shooting. So that was, I mean, a total dream to get to work that closely with someone. Well, we're excited that everyone can now see Cadillionaire. Is there anything else you wanted to add about that film before we leave? Uh, no, no. I'm, I'm so excited for you to see it. Well, I was excited and I was not disappointed. It really is another wonderful piece of work from you, Miranda. And thank you so much for joining us to talk about your career. And we look forward to seeing what you do next. Thank you very much for doing the screen talk. Thank you. Thanks thank for having me.